at me and tell me what you see I look at you and tell you what I feel Look at me and tell me what you see I look at you and tell you what I see So far, the month has consisted of Jeffrey Combs' horror movie classics of the 80s. Well, today, we'll be zooming forward all the way to 2001 with a movie that, due to difficulties with getting a distributor, was 15 years in the making. Welcome back to HP Lovecraft Month. Today we'll be taking a look at, once again, a Stuart Gordon film, Dagon, made in participation with the Spanish film industry. Now, although there is a Lovecraft story called Dagon, the film, however, is based on one of the most well-known stories, Shadow Over Innsmouth. So let's find out if the film can match the classic story of a town gone wrong. As the credits roll, the film opens with our main character, played by Ezra Godden, diving, immediately telling us that the story will revolve around the ocean and the hidden horrors within. As our diver finds a large pit in the shape of an eye, he looks at the carvings on the eye in the shape of bone, and as he wipes off the silt, he finds the thing is made of gold. But he also finds a mermaid staring at him, with her creepy, unblinking eyes. And her breasts, because it's a Stuart Gordon film. And she takes the guy's diving mask off for a surprise. <gasps> yeah, the film started with a dream sequence. But please, don't let that colour your perceptions of the film. The dream sequence does actually make sense later on in the film. Our main character, Paul Marsh, wakes up from his nightmare. He's an enterprising entrepreneur who's gotten rich from his dot-com business. He mentions that his nightmare is recurring and gotten worse recently, which will be important later. Also, the main character's name of Marsh is a reference to the fact that in the story, Innsmouth is run by the Marsh family. A little reference, or perhaps a nod to something else. More on that later. Marsh checks his company stocks, which isn't doing so well, and his girlfriend, Barbara, is annoyed that he's not relaxing on this holiday. So she rashly takes his laptop and throws it into the water, which would probably make me lose my shit if someone did that to me. Also, you'll notice that Marsh has red marks on his chest, which is a clever, subtle nod to later in the film, and you really wouldn't notice it if you weren't looking for it. While the arguing continues, they stop when they hear ominous chanting coming from the nearby coastal village. The other woman, Vicky, goes below deck, and while the others listen, a dark storm rolls over the mountains. And they start battening down the hatches, but the storm picks up speed and the water gets really choppy. They try to steer away, but a huge wave hits the side of the boat, forcing it into some rocks, and Vicky below deck manages to get her leg wedged between the hull and a rock trapping her. The others try to help her, but she's really stuck, and they can't get her free. Marsh tries to radio for help, but it's not working, as is the way of these things. He's given a flare gun to signal for help, firing one off, but there's no sign of life on shore. Vicky's husband volunteers to stay behind while Marsh and Barbara take the emergency raft to the shore, and we see Vicky's blood run out into the ocean when a black liquid appears moving towards the boat. Marsh and Barbara are on the raft as the storm worsens with lightning, and the raft springs a leak taking on water. Back on the boat, Vicky feels something, and they find the black liquid has seeped into the boat. See what? Shining a torch into some murky, waist-deep water and he can't see anything? Well, give that man a fucking medal. Also, is it me, or is this an unfathomable amount of misfortune for these people? You could argue that something's engineering this bad luck, but it really is the kind of series of unfortunate events that would have Lemony Snicket desperately clawing for the book rights. And continue the bad luck, the water in the boat surges with something grabbing Vicky. And back on the raft, Marsh and Barbara hear the gunshot, hoping it's not sharks. Pfft, please, as if a Lovecraft movie would have something as boring as sharks. The raft is having problems as the motor cuts out and they're forced to paddle to shore, as the ominous chanting is heard starting again. 
They get on the pier wondering where everyone is, and they find the chanting is coming from the church. Getting to the door, Marsh sees the same symbol from his dream above the church door, which seems to affect him. The plaque beneath the symbol, translated from the Spanish, means the esoteric order of Dagon. They're a cult that worship the old ones, Dagon specifically. Yeah, sorry to spoil that one for you. And although the film has been completely different to the story so far, this is the first thing that's the same. Also, I love the fact that Marsh is wearing a Miskatonic University sweatshirt. They bang on the door of the church, and when they do, the chanting suddenly stops, with everything getting eerily silent. And the church is completely empty. They've only been in the town for, what, five minutes? And already you can cut the atmosphere with a knife. It's really well done. Barbara wonders what kind of church that has strange tentacle-like statues, but then the priest appears. Barbara explains in Spanish what happened, and they show the priest where the boat is offshore. And he says that the sea is too rough, but Marsh tells him to ask the fishermen close by to help. The really creepy looking fishermen at that. And they agree to help, but the priest says someone should stay behind to call the police. Marsh tells Barbara to stay, even though he doesn't like the creepy priest. I'm not sure I want to leave you with this guy, because he gives me the creeps. I help senorita to find the police and the doctor. Oh, awkward. But hey, why didn't you speak English to them in the first place? Dick. And really, between the comparatively normal looking priest and these guys, I'd be more comfortable with the priest. Marsh gets on the boat as one of the guys bumps into him and he manages to get a fish hook lodged in his hand. Ezra Gordon based his performance, kind of, on the silent movie legend Harold Lloyd. That's why he's also wearing glasses. But Lloyd was a charming bumbler. It's getting ridiculous with Marsh's kind of pathetic amount of bad luck. Which honestly could be the point. Back with Barbara with her own problems. She tries phoning for the police, not sure why she waited this long to do that if she had a cell phone. But anyway, as horrors do, the phone doesn't work. And the priest suggests using the phone at the local hotel. And as he points, she sees he's got hideously webbed fingers. Huh, I guess he wasn't as normal as I thought. It's the crazy eyes he's got, always a tip off. Barbara makes her way to the hotel past a few locals who are all quite strange, either having their faces covered or are just ugly as sin. And in the hotel, she tries talking to the receptionist, but he just stands there staring, which either means her Spanish isn't that great, or he's pretty damn weird. I know which one I'm betting on. And when she tries to grab the phone, the receptionist grabs her with his tentacle hands, and then the priest appears to help the receptionist take her. Marsh gets to the boat, but getting inside, he finds it empty, with Vicky's bloodstained towel the only thing left. Marsh gets back to the pier and is greeted by the priest, who tells him that Barbara's left. La señorita goes to find the police. Where? In Santiago. 50 kilometers. No police in Imboca. And that's the first time we hear the name of the town. The place is called Imboca. Which is quite a clever name, because Imboca, in English, translates to Innsmouth. And I really like that, because if they'd have just called the place Innsmouth, that immediately puts your mind on the defensive and anticipating the horror. If you know the story, that is. Marsh gets to the hotel, speaking with the silent receptionist again. He finds Barbara's lighter asking about her, as he gets kind of freaked out by the guy's lack of blinking. Just, uh, just give me a room till she gets back. Rumo, please help. Ah, I see O Marshall went to woe to the same O Spanish O Claso I did O. Damo good O Claso. And as the receptionist goes to get Marsh a room key, he sees he has gills on his neck. Either that or he had a bad time shaving that morning. Marsh makes his way to his room. I love the fact that you can hear someone shush the creepy noise, which seems so goofy to me. In the room, Marsh finds it's quite disgusting, with the walls either covered in a mould, or that's the wallpaper. But I'm sure it's not a coincidence that they look like fish scales. Obviously, the bathroom is of similar disrepair, however, they did also install a bidet in there. I guess fish people need that extra luxury. The bed is also covered in mould, but frankly, I've slept in worse. As long as it's got free Wi-Fi, I'm good. Marsh sits down to wait for Barbara, playing with her lighter, and then suddenly Barbara walks in, surprising Marsh, as she stands by the window. However, when Marsh tries to talk to her, he finds it's not her. Ah! 
She has a hideous CGI effect in her mouth. Imboka truly is a horrible place. But it was another nightmare as Marsh wakes up, and it's lucky he did, because looking outside he sees the townsfolk have gathered, and now they see him, as the mob make their way to his room, presumably to take him. Marsh, panicking slightly, tries to leave, but hearing them coming, he tries to lock the door instead, but the bolt is missing. He didn't try locking the lock the key was already in, because that's far too unfeasible. So instead, he decides to unscrew the bolt off the outside of the bathroom door. There's so much wrong there, I'm just gonna move on. Marsh fumbles with the screws a bit, but he actually manages to attach the bolt to the door, just as the townsfolk get to it and start trying to get in. He politely asks if he can help them, but that just seems to make them angry, with them bashing down the door. Marsh gets through another door, barricading it with a wardrobe, as the townsfolk continue to barge in through more doors. This scene is almost directly lifted from the story, and if you played the game Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth, it'll be very familiar to you. And it really is the true essence of horror. It's that feeling of something's coming for you that won't stop, and you have to keep running. It's very pure in that sense, and the scene gets across the desperation perfectly, with Ezra Gordon's acting spot on. The townsfolk break in, and Marsh is forced to jump out the window into a glass ceiling below, and remarkably he's not slashed to ribbons by it. He seems to have fallen into some kind of tannery, as he finds a pigskin hung up. He gets to the door and looking through he sees a car show up with some kind of leader inside giving instructions and the townsfolk start searching the building for Marsh. He hides with a pocket knife for defence but that's when he sees it's not just pig skins they're tanning but humans as well as he finds the skin of the other man from the boat hung up alerting the townsfolk to his presence. He finds some flammable liquid dousing the place and setting it on fire which Marsh uses to escape. Marsh manages to hide from the townsfolk, but that's when he meets another actual human. Ah, the traditional Imboka greeting there. Marsh gets him to keep quiet as they hide from a very mutated townsperson, and he threatens the guy with his pocket knife to remain quiet. Marsh starts asking questions, and the old man tells him that both the women are dead. He even says that he saw them die. No one leave, Imboka. People come. No one leave. The old man is played by Spanish actor Francisco Rabal, who sadly died shortly after the film's completion. And his role is essentially Zardok Allen from the story, who was this crazy old town drunk who told the protagonist everything about Innsmouth. In the story, he's largely just exposition, but we'll find that in the film he's given a bit more to do. However, before that, he still needs to give Marsh a load of exposition with a handy flashback, as he tells Marsh what happened in Imboka. He tells Marsh that when he was a young boy, the fishing town was failing to gather any more fish from the sea. So they prayed to God, but it didn't help. A man came and told him that his God answers prayers, and they should pray to Dagon. The man is thrown out, but a few townsfolk help pray and call to Dagon. I hear first time, new prayer. Yeah, yeah, Azul of Atare. As we see them cower in fear from something huge, but we don't see it ourselves. That prayer, Ei Ei Cthulhu Fatachen, is possibly one of the most well known aspects of Lovecraft's stories. It's a nice reference, but it doesn't really make much sense, because it's a prayer to Cthulhu and not Dagon. After praying, the town starts producing fish again, but also gold from the sea. However, the boy's father throws it back, knowing where it came from. The townsfolk then go about destroying everything in the church, with the stranger killing the priest, and the esoteric order of Dagon is born. They then kill the boy's father and take his mother for what we don't know, and force the boy to follow the order. Two possibilities. Either you're drunk, or you're totally fucking insane. Or both, don't forget that. But really, he's seen the creepy fish people. He should be at least a little bit convinced by the guy. Marsh asks if there's a car he can use to escape the town, but the old man says there's no cars in Imboka. But the old man knows where there's at least one left, and they find the car outside a mansion. They see the leader of the town get out of his car, and he's quite severely mutated, and the old man tells him that everyone is changing to go into the sea. Marsh says he'll trust him when he suddenly gets a pain in his chest, so the old man decides to distract the fish people, acting crazy and drunk. Best he sticks to what he knows. And Marsh checks the car, but the keys are missing, so he tries hot-wiring it, accidentally turning on the horn instead. So he's forced to run and hide inside the mansion. 
Marsh runs from the townspeople searching for him, getting inside a room. And then he finds literally the girl of his dreams, which shocks Marsh to say the least. The mutated guy comes to investigate the commotion, but she manages to get him to leave while Marsh hides behind the door. Marsh thanks her and she recognises him too as she knows about his dreams and she's been waiting for him. Then they start kissing. Frankly, I wouldn't be so willing to do that because, let's be honest, that is again textbook crazy eyes right there. The kissing gets quite heated to say the least and Marsh is getting quite into it until he finds she's got a little surprise hiding below. <laughs> Well, that'll make sex a bit complicated, to say the least. What the hell is that? Yeah, I'm a little confused, too. How do I, you know, with the tail and all? I'm not your first, am I? I mean, I, I lay my eggs, then I leave, and you release your fertilizer. <gasps> Why couldn't she be the other kind of mermaid? With the fish part on top, and the lady part on the bottom? Marsh understandably runs the hell away from Squid Lady, straight into the leader's chauffeur. Well, I guess those haven't mutated yet then. Marsh gets the keys, but the guy grabs him as they roll down the stairs. So Marsh beats him unconscious with his mobile phone. I gotta get a bigger cell phone. Marsh gets the car started and drives away with the townsfolk trying to chase after him. There's more townspeople on the road who Marsh hits, causing him to go off the road killing the car. He tries to fix the wheel, but is grabbed by the guy he hit, and Marsh beats the guy, this time with a hubcap. He breaks into a house which is completely flooded, probably because fish people like it that way, and while hiding, a young boy finds him shouting for help. Marsh grabs the kid to keep him quiet, then I assume his father appears from the water to throw Marsh around a little bit. He starts to drown him in the toilet, because that's the only water source the room obviously has. And Marsh whacks him over the head with the toilet lid, knocking him out. Which is the second time Marsh has fought back. Which is good to see, because he's not just a scared bunny rabbit and can actually defend himself. He's chased outside, and that's when he's finally caught by the townsfolk and knocked out. Marsh dreams about the ocean, some more foreshadowing there, and when he comes to, he finds that Barbara is still alive. The old man is also there, presumably captured after the car distraction. Marsh also finds that Vicky's there as well, slightly mad and missing a leg. Which really makes it worse for that other guy from the boat. Out of all of these people, including the drunken guy, he gets killed off first. That's just salting the wound, really. Vicky tells them of the ordeal she's been through, and she says that it's inside her, and the old man tries to explain. Pick up her. Take her. Then he stops beating around the bush. He fuck her. And Barbara tells Marsh to promise to kill her if the same thing that happened to Vicky happens to her, which is possibly a tad extreme. You know, considering she doesn't really know what happened to Vicky, and she could just be a bit mental for all she knows. But all of this stuff does add to the sense of impending horror and doom, because our heroes are basically on the chopping block right now. The townsfolk return for their captives with Vicky freaking out, but Marsh waits by the door and when it opens, he punches the priest in the face. But he's stopped by a knife wielder, until the old man decides to kick some ass, with Barbara joining as well. The old man is holding them back, but Barbara is grabbed and the old man loses his knife and is grabbed too. However, Vicky takes the knife, causing everyone to stop. And because she can't handle what's happened to her, she stabs herself in the stomach, killing herself. But at least the spawn of Dagon is killed too, I guess. Barbara is taken away and Marsh with the old man are taken to be skinned. And why is the old man topless but Marsh isn't? That's sexism, that is. And just blatant fan service for the ladies in the audience. Shameless. Marsh tries to bribe the guy with $10 million, but yeah, they get gold from Dagon, so they don't really care about money. Marsh apologises to the old man, but he says Marsh helped him remember his family, and defiantly says they die like men, as the priest starts cutting his face off. I gotta admit, the skinning scene is pretty damn gruesome, and the effects are very convincing. 
It should also be noted that Marsh helps the old man by reciting Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that one. Now, I mention that because the way Marsh is acting now will be very important at the end, so keep it in mind. The old man is killed and the priest starts on Marsh's face. However, he's saved from skinning by Squid Lady, who stops them. She explains that Marsh must stay with her, and he says that he'll stay if she lets Barbara go. Until you came, there'd be no sacrifices for a year. Dagon needs her. Fuck Dagon! Yes. Wow. There's not much you can say after that, really, is there? Squid Lady talks about the forever of immortality in the ocean with Dagon, which Marsh admits that he doesn't have much of a choice. So Squid Lady wheels away, and Marsh is released from his shackles. But when he's given a second, he gets free, killing the two guys with knives, and then faces off with the priest, stabbing him in the stomach. Which, I gotta admit, feels pretty good. Marsh takes some gasoline and goes to the church to find Barbara. He finds a tunnel leading below the building, and at the same time, Squid Lady is torturing Barbara, cutting her with an impractical as fuck knife. See? I told ya. The crazy eyes, they never lie. And bizarrely, the townsfolk are wearing the skins of people. I'm not quite sure why though, but religion always baffles me, frankly. Barbara's hung above the pit in the middle of the room, and Squid Lady throws the Triforce into Call to Dagon, signalling it's sexy time for him. Barbara is lowered into the pit, but Marsh shows up to start lighting everyone on fire. <laughs> Looks like fish people aren't taught stop, drop and roll. The guy lowering Barbara runs off, causing her to fall faster, but Marsh manages to stop the winch and pull her up. He tries to get her out of there with her asking him to kill her like he promised. She might be okay as long as she manages to get to the... Uh, okay, maybe not now. Marsh is beaten up by the other townsfolk, the ones not currently on fire. But Squid Lady gets him to clear off and even the leader has a go at kicking Marsh when he's down. But stops when Squid Lady tells him who Marsh is, showing him Marsh's red marks on his chest. The leader says he's been looking for Marsh for a long time and tells him he's his son. And Squid Lady explains that Marsh's mother and Squid Lady's father got together. Which you'd think his mother would have told Marsh about that. Granted the guy wasn't always sashimi but still. Also that makes Marsh and Squid Lady brother and sister. Man, just when I thought sex with added tentacles couldn't get any more... Ugh. And then the leader takes his mask off so we can see what these people will eventually turn into. And the effects are really good looking, albeit a bit derpy looking. But Marsh is mad as hell and he's not going to take it anymore, as he douses himself in petrol and sets himself on fire, as he and Squid Lady fall down the pit into the water. However, there's an added twist to this story, as the marks on Marsh's chest are in fact gills but they are kind of difficult to make out on his horribly burned as hell body. But this does bring me back to what I mentioned right at the start of the movie, with Marsh's name. Because in the story, the Marsh family ruled Innsmouth. So the film could possibly be saying that after Marsh's fishman transformation, he and his family come back to rule in Boca. I'm just wildly speculating, but I like to think that's the case. And the film ends with Marsh and Squid Lady swimming off together into the great eye of Dagon to be together forever. Ah, oh, isn't that nice? Ah, uh, no, that's a terrible ending. Marsh has seen his friends and girlfriend horribly murdered by these people, and for fuck's sake, he tried to burn himself alive to get away from them. But suddenly he's Aquaman and all is fucking forgiven. This is why I said to remember him helping the old man. Because this ending makes no sense to Marsh's character. He has no reason to just accept his new life as a fish man. And it's only there so they can harken back to the novel where the main character suspects that he himself will eventually turn into a fish man. So there you go. That was Dagon. Although not really a movie version of Shadow Over Innsmouth, it's more of a retelling of the story really. But it's honestly a damn good one. The acting is solid, the atmosphere is palpable, and the whole film is tense and panicky, with an air of desperation throughout, which is how it should be. But seriously, why do they need to fuck it up with the terrible ending that makes Marsh look like a complete prick for forgetting his friends and girlfriend's deaths? It's my only real complaint, but it does impact the film negatively for me, as there's no satisfying conclusion whatsoever. It just ends abruptly and without warning. 
Also, I find it funny to think about the townsfolk above the pit just standing there, wondering what the fuck they're gonna do now. So we're three movies down, and one more to go for HP Lovecraft Month. And I'm not too sure what I'm gonna do next. But tell me something. Do you read Sutter Kane?